Okay, good evening. Welcome, and uh, we will commence our meeting with the roll call, please. Uh, Ms. Goodell? Uh, Mr. Castillo? Here. Mr. Lawrence? Here. Mr. Sharp? Here. Mr. Webb? Here. Okay. Okay, the uh, first item on the agenda tonight is a closed meeting. Uh, could uh, somebody please uh, read us into a uh, closed meeting? I apologize, the first thing after we start the meeting, we're going to disappear on you for a little bit, so. There you go. Pursuant to the Virginia Freedom of Information Act, I move the board commence a closed meeting for the following purposes to discuss or consider the identified subject matter personnel under section 2.2 dash 3711A1, in particular staff appointments, staff resignations, staff changes in positions, non-reappointment and advisory committee appointments and reappointments, and student matters under section 2.23711A2, in particular student residency. Second. Okay, thank you. Uh, I. Aye. Okay, we will now uh, have a closed meeting for a few moments, so uh, please bear with us. I hope this won't take too long. Thanks.
Okay, could I get a motion to reconvene the open meeting? So moved. We have a second. Second. Call the roll. Okay, uh, Mr. Ankuma. Uh, Mr. Castillo. Yes. Ms. Carney. Mr. Lawrence. Yes. Mr. Sharp. Here. Ms. Ward. Yes. And Mr. Webb. Yes. Thank you. And uh, would somebody like to certify the closed meeting? Mr. Chair, whereas the Falls Church Public School Board has convened a closed meeting on this date pursuant to an affirmative recorded vote and in accordance with the provisions of Virginia Freedom of Information Act and whereas section 2.2-3711B of the Code of Virginia requires a certification by the school board that such closed meeting was conducted in conformity with Virginia law. Now therefore be it resolved that the Falls Church Public School Board hereby certifies that to the best of each member's knowledge, one, only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements by Virginia law were discussed in the closed meeting to which this certification applies, and two, only such bus public business matters as were identified in the motion convening the closed meeting were heard, discussed, or considered. Second. Call the roll, please. Yes, please, sir. Uh, Mr. Castillo. Aye. Mr. Lawrence. Yes. Mr. Sharp. Yes. Ms. Ward. Mr. Webb. Yes. Thank you. Okay, we, uh, we did a roll call, but we've had a late arrival, so we, uh, should, should we do another roll call? And Let's see. Mr. Castillo. Here. Uh, Mr. Lawrence. Yes. Mr. Sharp. Here. Ms. Ward. Here. Mr. Webb. Here. Thank you. Okay, if you all please uh, rise and join me in the pledge, please. to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, the next item is adoption of the agenda. We have a motion to adopt the agenda. So moved. Second. Second. Okay, call the roll. Oh, just do a voice vote, too. Voice vote is fine. All in favor of adopting the agenda as proposed? Say aye. 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 Okay. Any uh, abstentions or negative votes? Okay. Now we come to the public comment session. Uh, do we have any public comments? Any speaker slips? We do not, sir. Okay. And so now we move on to recognitions and reports. Uh, the first item on the agenda, and, and I think there's a palpable air of anticipation here, the special appearance of Gertie Giraffe, Thackeray, the Thackeray mascot. Welcome, Gertie. Gertie, come on up and get, get immortalized here up at the podium. And watch your step, please. <laughs> we don't want to lose you on day one. <laughs> Gertie, welcome. <laughs> Three more steps to the left. Oh my goodness. <laughs> we taking a picture. All, all right, let's let's get a picture here. Come on. <laughs> Gertie Stevens. <laughs> Thank you, Gertie. <laughs> We're gonna have to get Gertie a GPS or something here. Oh. <laughs> Wait. 
hope that Gertie makes it out alive here. Um, well done, thank you. All right, next up we have recognition of the spring student athletes. Um, and I see a lot of student athletes out there. Why don't we start with uh, uh, my personal favorite. How about girls soccer? Alice says hi, by the way. Come on up and be recognized. Hello, everyone. Uh, we're here to represent girls soccer. We're the four seniors. I'm Claire. I'm Camille. I'm Erica. And I'm Rebecca. Uh, so our season so far this year, so far because it's still going on, um, has been great. Uh, we won, well there wasn't a districts tournament because of all the snow, um, but we, <laughs> we won the like overall district, uh, regular season districts. Um, and then we also were conference champs and regional champs this past Friday, uh, and then we're going down to Radford on Thursday to compete in the state tournament. So hopefully we'll bring another trophy back. Uh, that's the plan anyway. Um, we've, we have like so many talented players. We had a ton of people named to teams for districts and conferences and regionals. We had eight girls on first and second team for all of those. Um, so that's huge for us and um, yeah, we went, uh, we're undefeated this season, uh, which, yeah, yeah, uh, that hasn't happened in a very long time, uh, so that's been great. And we want to thank our parents for supporting us and our coaches and the school board uh, because we couldn't have done it without you guys. Yeah. Well, thank you and, and good luck to you all. Thank so you. Thank, thank you. you. All right, uh, how about next up, uh, boys tennis? Coach Matt Sowers and... Hi, my name is Yosh Gagal. I'm representing boys varsity tennis. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight on behalf of George Mason boys tennis team. We ended up having three freshmen, six sophomores, one junior and six seniors this year on the team. Uh, our record this year is 15 wins and two losses. The senior class helped win three regional championships, state title in 2010, 2011, and 2012, and over 250 total wins. Vincent Camacho, David Draba, Jacob Field, Nate Jones, and Jacob Morris and Rohan Rana are our seniors this year. Some of the, our postseason highlights, our team took second at regionals this year. We advanced to the state tournament at Radford after winning the state semifinal match this week versus Glenvar High School. Jacob Morris is in the state singles tournament and Nate Jones and Jacob Morris are in the state doubles tournament. We want to thank a few people for their support this season. We appreciate all you do to support our winning program. Dr. Jones, Mr. Bird, Mr. Hills, Mr. Horn, Ms. Braven, Nancy Hendrickson, bus drivers Bob and Daryl, Ms. Gallagher, school board members, our fans, and our families. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, girls tennis, Coach uh, Alex Ware, the, come on up. Hi, um, so we're part of the tennis team and I'm Dana. I'm Peggy. I'm Katie. <laughs> I'm Madison. And <laughs> we're the seniors on the tennis team. And first we wanted to thank you for our beautiful new courts. Um, thank the administrators for coming out to some of our matches. Uh, the parents and the coaches who su supported us throughout the season. Um, the athletic boosters for helping us fund our, for our uniforms and Without everyone's support, our season wouldn't have been the same. So Peggy will talk about our season. We had a fantastic season. We won districts, conference, we placed second at regionals, and we made it to the state semifinals. And we worked so hard, and it wouldn't have been possible without our two new coaches, uh, Coach Ware and Coach Ferreira. It's been so much fun, and uh, without their support, we wouldn't have been able to go as far as we did. And um, 
Our number one singles, Kennedy Mooney, and our number one doubles, Kennedy and Carrington Mooney, will be traveling to Radford in hopes of winning states. So we wish them luck and we know they'll do great. Um, this season we had 18 girls, which is huge. Um, and many of them are freshmen and there's a lot of young talent and although the team will be losing six seniors, we know they'll do great and hopefully they'll win states next year. So lastly, thank you to everyone who supported us and helped us get to where we did. <laughs> so <laughs> thank, thank you, you so much. All right. Okay, uh, next up, boys soccer. Coach Spinell is... Uh, hi, I'm Paul Darmstadter. Hi, I'm Brian Connolly. And uh, we're two seniors on the boys soccer team. Um, and so far our season has been stellar. We've uh, won the regular season, we've won the conference championship and the region championship. Um, and we have uh, states, the state championship tournament, next or this coming weekend down at Radford. Um, and hopefully we'll get our second state championship in a row. We won last year and hopefully this year we'll win again. Um, and I'd like to thank uh, the school board, uh, Dr. Jones, um, all the coaches and parents and uh, students for coming out, supporting us at all our games. Uh. All right, well, thank you very much. <laughs> okay, and then uh, last we have uh, Coach Harvey and uh, Boys and Girls All-State Athletes. Thank you, school board, and thank you for the recognition of our fantastic team. I want to be, have the pleasure of introducing the two state champions, Tara Holman and Truman Custer. And they're going to speak. Uh, greetings, school board members, superintendent, assistant superintendent, and all the coaches and students who are here tonight. On behalf of the track and field team, I want to thank you all for your efforts and continual support. Without it, we would not have the means to accomplish the success that we've had this year. In efforts to respect your time, I would like to share with you a few highlights from the season. Um, but undoubtedly, the first highlight, if not the most instrumental, would be receiving Coach Harvey as our coach. For those who are unaware or unknowledgeable about her success, her resume extends beyond accomplishing um, state titles for herself, but also she was a, an elite athlete and an internationally recognized runner. Um, she's participated in the Pan-Olympic Games, the Olympic Trials, and many other notable track and field events. However, after sharing numerous two to three hour practices, four hour bus rides, um, I've noticed along with my fellow athletes that it's not just Coach Harvey's knowledge of track and field that's really achieved the girls' track and field conference title when we haven't received a single championship in over 13 years. It's not simply her knowledge that brought an impressive 21 athletes to the state meet or gained seven new records or trained two state champions. Along with her knowledge, it's her warmth, her passion, her unwillingness to receive anything but the best from myself and my fellow athletes. So that's why I'm standing here and I'm gonna thank her tonight. I'm very proud of our accomplishments and I really hope that we can continue this um, and I want to thank you guys also as well. Uh, hi, I'm Truman Custer. I'm um, here to represent the boys team. Guys, stand up. <laughs> um, with a combination of these guys and um, the other JV player, or JV runners and the other varsity runners, we had one of the most successful seasons that we've ever had. Um, at Mason. Uh, the last time that we've scored uh, this much at the state meet was back in uh, 2006 when we had about four individual state title um, runners and so this year was really a good showing for uh, the City of Falls Church and George Mason High School and um, you know we wouldn't have done it without your support and we really appreciate uh, everything that you you guys do for us so thank you very much. 
Thank you very much. All right, well, thank you again, and congratulations on great seasons and, and great seasons uh, yet to finish. Um, we now will go on the next item on the agenda to recognition of student liaisons. Uh, let's see, we have uh, Maeve Curtin. We'd like to, uh, in, in addition to everything else that you do, Maeve, uh, you're the liaison to the gifted and talented uh, committee, and we'd just like to give you a certificate to uh, recognize you and thank you for all you've done. And then also uh, from the ESOL committee, do we have uh, Uri Chow and Giovanna Bordiso? Are they here tonight? Come on up. And maybe we can get a picture uh, as well here. Squeeze it, squeeze it, squeeze it. Could you guys move like three? <laughs> All right, thank you again for your, uh, your service to the boards. Appreciate that. Um, we'll All right, next on the agenda are the uh, annual reports to the school board. Dr. Jones. Mr. Castillo? Yes. Sorry, can I just say one thing about that real quick? Absolutely, Ms. Okay. Curtin, please. Um, I just want to thank um, all the athletes for being here. You guys can leave for sure. Um, <laughs> it'll be a long meeting, but hang on one second. Congratulations to you all, and especially Wari and Giovanna. Thank you guys so much for serving on the ESOL committee. Um, next year, we're going to have a lot more students on all of the school board advisory committees, so that's going to be a way for some of the underclassmen who are here tonight if you want to get involved um, in more school board stuff. Um, that'll be a wonderful way for you guys to get involved in that. So hopefully next year we'll have more people getting those recognitions and reports. And have a good night, guys. Yes, thank you all again. Okay, uh, next is uh, adoption of the uh, consent agenda. Shall we adopt the uh, consent agenda by, by uh, voice vote? Any, any objections? Someone. Okay, thank you. Was there an item on, on the, the agenda that you wanted to remove? Just it, We just discussed clarification. Okay, yes. Okay, got it. All right, the next item on the agenda. Yes, Mr. Kimball. I think we, we did it by a voice vote. Yes. Were there any abstentions or disagreement or, or no votes? No. Okay. Uh, next, we move to the approval of the appointment of the student liaison to the school board. And uh, Dr. Jones, do you have a, a recommendation for us? We are very excited um, to be recommending Zach tonight um, to step into Maeve's shoes. And I told him he has a big shoes to fill, and we're very excited to have him. So if we could approve him, uh, and then they will actually swear you in in just a moment. Okay, does, it, does anybody uh, on the board have any, uh, any questions? Do we have a motion? Uh, I move that the Falls Church City Public School Board approve the appointment of Zach Witzel as student liaison to the school board from July 1st, 2014 to June 30th, 2015. Second. Any, uh, any questions? All, all in favor? Aye. 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 I think, could we do a roll call? I think it's... We can do a roll call, certainly. Absolutely, certainly. Okay. Mr. Castillo. Yes. Mr. Lawrence. Yes. Mr. Sharp. Yes. Ms. Ward. 
Mr. Webb. Yes. Great. It's unanimous. It's official. Yes. Welcome. Uh, Mr. Kibble, could we swear Mr. Witzel in? I'll stand where you do, okay. like where you are, if you want to stand over here. Um, could you raise your right hand? Do you, uh, Zachary Witzel, solemnly affirm that you will support the mission of the Falls Church City Public Schools, endeavor to serve all students in your decisions and actions, and will faithfully and impartially discharge and perform the duties incumbent upon you as the student liaison of the school board, according to the best of your ability, so help you God. Yes. Congratulations, welcome. Picture. We're not done with you yet, come on up. And congratulations. Congratulations, welcome. Congratulations. Congratulations, welcome. Picture. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would just like to say that I, I'm sad to see you Maeve go, but I'm, I'm welcome to see you come on board, and uh, I, I think you've started off uh, on a very positive note, very proactive, very communicative, and, and uh, looking forward to working with you. Does anybody else have uh, any comments, Mr. Webb? Um, I had the pleasure to meet with Zach over the weekend just before, and I gave him the, uh, I think he's going to do a great job, but as I told him, he's a budding politician doing what all nominees have to do, meeting with all the, uh, the folks who will be voting on his appointment to be the student liaison. So I'm like, as I've told Meg many a time, Meg many a times, uh, budding politicians coming up through George Mason that know the... Uh, know the area that they live in and have learned how to, to maneuver in those, those corridors. But we look forward to working with you this upcoming year. Anyone else, Mr. Lawrence? Uh, I would just like to say that the, uh, the, the point about meeting with people was something that you know, Zach knew he had to do and his dad said, well, I'm not really sure you might be you know, bugging them and annoying them and, and he had the right instinct because you know, he knows he's gonna be with us for a year and it's, uh, a punishment for some, but uh, I think he's going to be good. And uh, Maeve set up a meeting about, uh, about what four or six weeks ago where we met, and he was actually foolish enough to take Maeve's advice, which is to say, you know, see if John would be your, your mentor. And I, I agreed to do that, so I'm looking forward very much to this, to this year. I think it's going to be great. Anyone else? Okay, well, again, welcome board and uh I hope you know what you're getting yourself into here. Congratulations, Zach. I know you're going to do a wonderful job. And I am so happy that I'm leaving this position in <laughs> your, not, not that I'm leaving this position. Yeah, there don't was a very pause. important part at the end there um, in your hands. And I know you're just going to be amazing. Um, you're the perfect candidate for the job. And I'm so glad that you wanted to fill this role. and. Um, I feel like the student liaison position is um, going to be something that's very important to the Falls Church City Public School System, and I'm glad that we're starting off so strong. So, thank you. Yes, thank you again. Um, uh, the next item on the agenda, uh, and, and by the way, I, I don't think we should uh, let it go unremarked. Uh, thank Mr. Lawrence for really taking the lead and. Uh, activating the student liaison, which I think was a, a great move, and I think one that had uh, great and very substantial benefits for this uh, school board. Um, I, I think it's also something I'm looking forward to seeing uh, spread to uh, the advisory committees, because I think it's a, it's a great opportunity to get some vital input. So thank you again, Mr. Lawrence. Um, the next item on the agenda is a uh, is a sad one. It's a resolution in honor of uh, Steve Sprague for his con contributions to the Falls Church City Public Schools. Um, Mr. Sharp, would you would you like to uh, give us some of your thoughts about this uh, this sad passing? 
it is quite a loss to our community and particularly to the schools. And I, um, I'm pleased to be able to uh, say a few words, having known Steve for a number of years and known the family uh, uh, since I was uh, a soccer coach for Beth Sprague in, in uh, uh, her elementary grade years. But uh, there's a very, very uh, good article uh, discussing Steve's contributions to the, so the political side of the community, uh, the social service side uh, that uh, Phil Duncan and uh, uh, um, our, our uh, Commissioner of the Revenue, Tom Clinton, and, uh, and also Sally Eckfeld, who was a chair of the school board here, they combined to provide a, a, a very good uh, statement of, of Steve's many contributions on the, the civic side, particularly with the Housing Corporation, with CBC and, and, and others. On the resolution that we have here tonight, there's a really, uh, really good set out of his contributions to the school community. And uh, one of the most poignant uh, parts of the award ceremony uh, last week was the uh, giving of an award from uh, his family uh, to one of our students, a uh, scholarship form. And so his, his legacy lives on uh, beyond just uh, uh, the, 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 the very uh, unfortunately short period that he was able to be with us. Uh, but uh, he also uh, contributed greatly to his church, the Dual and Methodist Church. And uh, from that side, uh, I, I think when you consider uh, the memoriams that he's requested uh, as contributions, uh, the two, two that he's requested, one is to the schools, to the scholarship program that I mentioned, and that uh, donations to that can go to the Falls Church Education Foundation. But the other is a endowment for the uh, Dual and United Methodist Church. I think those, those two requests reflect uh, some of his priorities. Uh, I'll, I'll just mention, uh, since I don't know that anyone else has, has covered that, that aspect of it, uh, the, the Doolin Church uh, is a unique contributor to this community. Uh, over uh, on, uh, many, many years and on many, many occasions with six-figure contributions to uh, to, act, to activist groups in this community. The church has been just such a strong supporter of, of those who are in need in our community and in the, in the surrounding area. And Steve was a big, big part of that. He was not uh, often in a leadership role, uh, but uh, he was always in a strongly contributing role. And, and all of these... Uh, successes that he participated in, uh, both at the schools and uh, at his church and in civic life, live on. Uh, he will be with us and remembered for a very, very long time. Thank you. And, and with that, may I, uh, may I have a motion? Sorry, my, my, uh, uh, mine is not moving very quickly. I move that the school board approve and adopt resolution 06-14, resolution in honor of Steve Sprague for the, his contributions to the Falls Church City Public Schools in memoriam as presented. Thank you. Second. Second. Uh, why don't we take a voice vote on this, please? Certainly, sir. Mr. Castillo. Yes. Mr. Lawrence. Yes. Mr. Sharp. Yes. Ms. Ward. Mr. Webb. Yes. Thank you. Uh, would anybody else like to uh, make some comments on this resolution? Mr. Webb? Um, just seconding what 
Karen was just saying about Steve. I got to know Steve a little over the last um, few years, more so through his activity with CBC, and as well as I actually attend dueling fairly regularly uh, here in the city, uh, my partner and I, and just to see Steve and his involvement in the city of, of being a person who is just became the fabric of what Falls Church is all about, of being active in the community. Steve, from the housing corporation, uh, to his church, to CBC, to the schools and Falls Church Education Foundation. Steve is Mr. Everything in Falls Church and we definitely are going to, to miss him in this community, but his mark will always be felt here and he's made sure of that through uh, the church as well as the scholarship that's gonna be coming through the Falls Church Education Association. So his uh, legacy will continue to live on in our community. Um, for a long time to come, but uh, we definitely saw a felt a big loss when Steve passed away. But we all know that he's in a, a much better place, and Falls Church will continue to have him as a part of our our community. Thank you. And I I would second that. I think the the work that he's done again. I think some of the things that we we see about Falls Church. What's uh, great on all fronts is the amount of involvement and commitment to the community and I think his his legacy is one of the uh, shining examples of that. Uh, Ms. Curtin, did, did you, I, I don't want to overlook you, I apologize if I have, okay, thank you. All right, uh, next on the agenda, discussion of budget advocacy with senators and delegates. Uh, Ms. Ward, would you like to, or, or Mr. Sharp, why don't we start with you, Ms. Ms. Ward, about this. So um, to um, help support uh, our representatives in getting this budget passed, this impasse passed, um, I've drafted a letter um, as an individual um, to mail to our representatives um, stating my position as a a parent of a student who attends Virginia Public Schools, a teacher in Virginia Public Schools, and as a member of the Falls Church City School Board. Um, I basically stated my position in this and uh, encouraged um, them to please help get this budget passed so we can hire people. <laughs> um, I presented it here to all of you so you could take a look at it if you would like to use it as a template for creating your own letter. Um, <clears throat> I um, decided to go ahead with the individual letter after speaking with Tony. Um, apparently the more letters we send, the more impact it will have. So I'm not opposed to doing one from the board, um, but I think it's also a good idea if we write them individually as um, as citizens of Falls Church City. Mr. Webb, do you have a... Uh, I support that, but things have very quickly changed uh, in this budget impasse as of today they will be passing a budget because of a member of the General Assembly who resigned and then and overall it changed the entire dynamic of the, the battle because by that one member of resigning the state senate is now in the other party's control and the budget will be passed without the uh, the Medicaid expansion being a part of it right now. So I think it's still good for us to at least let them know our position on this, but uh, it definitely has changed from as quickly as Sunday to today. Well, that was the best project I never had to complete. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that information. Any thoughts on the, I, mean, I think there, there may be some value. I, I, you know, I know you've done a lot of hard work on this. I, I think um, in the unlikely event that we run into this again, it might be worth having some, some uh, note for the record here about how things should be conducted in the future. Any thoughts as to the value of that or uh, has this been overtaken by events? I, w I would just say that letting your representative know what you support can never be a mistake. I mean, we both know that, you know, SAS Law and Simon support what we support. But even if they hadn't had the change that we had in the last, you know, 72 hours, 
you know, they need to know how many people support what they already support because it, it gives them ammunition going in because otherwise, you know, if somebody says, well, what are you hearing? And they're saying, well, you know, I've got a couple letters in favor and I've got a whole bunch of people who really hate it, then it, it weakens their position with their colleagues. So despite the change and despite the fact that they already support it, the, the more the, the better, frankly. Any other thoughts? I think Mr. Lawrence stated it very well, and we have some very fine examples from uh, Margaret and from the VSBA uh, to work from, and I encourage all of us to follow through and get the letters out. Ms. Kurt? I think I, looking at this, um, I plan on writing a letter just from the student's perspective. Um, obviously, it's not as much of a pressing need, but seeing as my current position as a graduating senior, I should be able to get something done pretty quickly and just get it down to them and just, you know, for future use as well. So thank you for doing that, Mrs. Ward. And I do think it is important to uh, make it clear that this uh, this is no way to run a railroad, and, and that we even were having this conversation, I think, is, is not a good sign. I think um, one of the uh, fundamental aspects of, of self-governance is, is, is governing, and passing a budget, I think, is part and parcel of that. So I think uh, it, it is good to make this clear for the record so that uh, we never find ourselves in a similar position again. So I encourage everyone, and. Uh, people in the community as well to uh, make your voices heard. Next on the agenda is a review of ordinance language for the Mount Daniel project. Dr. Jones. This is really just making sure that the school board um, can see that we are moving forward with what we need to do behind the scenes on behalf of, we're working with the city staff. Um, they did have first reading on Monday night, so you know, read this carefully, and, and it went through a lot of tweaks working you know, with the attorney and making sure everything was just right. Um, the second reading will be on July 14th, um, and again, that matches that timeline that we sent out uh, you know, initially to make sure that we're ready for referendum in November, and so everything is on target, um, and also trying to avoid you know, anything in August so that if the judge was on vacation, and we can't get stuff signed, um, we don't get stuck into a corner. So, um, and again, the, the uh, ordinance is uh, for the Mount Daniel project, which we will have ASAC committee uh, look at the three final proposals on July 10th and then be bringing a request uh, with, I think it's that next two weeks, the meeting after that, uh, to the school board based on what the ASAC committee and, and everybody thinks is the best proposal from the three finalists. And we're very excited for those of us that are on the committee about what we're seeing. So we think we will have a great proposal to bring to the school board. Any questions or comments? Mr. Lawrence? Just one clarification, because some board members have asked. There are three finalists. The board will see all three. The, the ASAC will say, this one is our recommendation, but this board will see all three finalists. So it's not that you're only going to get to see one. Yeah, you don't really see them, and yet, because then on July 10th, you're welcome to come. I mean, it's an open meeting, so if you really want to see detail, because the, each one takes an hour, um, and they'll do an hour proposal. So what happens with ASEC is they bring the recommendation to the school board, and then he'll give you the synopsis of what the other two were like, um, you know, what the committee liked about them, what they found is um, not positive maybe about them. Uh, but the focus is really on that final proposal that the whole, the whole team uh, feels like should come to the school board. So if you really want to see the whole three hours, I would encourage you to come that night, because they are fun to watch. Um, but but I think we're going to have a great proposal that really, you know, rises to the top and feel great about the process. Thank you, thank you Dr. Jones. Uh, any other comments, Mr. Sharp? Yeah, I just want to thank uh, John and Tony, especially uh, leading the charge on this, uh, overcoming some very, very extraordinary circumstances that uh, really should have delayed this project beyond where it is, and instead it's accelerated uh, to the point where we anticipate uh, being able to enter a, a new school in, in a very, very short period of time uh, in, in a relative sense. And uh, we had weather problems. We had meeting difficulties. Uh, partly the weather was, was a contributor there, but just uh, getting the, the, uh, the different components of the community together for these meetings, uh, the different contractors, uh, the, all, all of the, uh, the, the proposal uh, timeline was, was pushed back uh, a couple of times, 
and uh, we also had uh, a change in, in the board uh, during this, this time period, which uh, our leadership had to deal with, Susan and John and Tony, and uh, that was an extraordinary circumstance that we, we didn't have the last time that we were trying to prepare for this, uh, when it was Mary Ellen Henderson instead of Mount Daniel. Uh, getting, getting a referendum prepared and getting it, uh, getting it launched and then getting it to be a success uh, requires uh, a great deal of, of effort and coordination and we're off to a great start. Thank you. Mr. Webb. Uh, I also want to echo and, and thank Tony and John for their work on this. Um, I was at the the uh, meeting last evening and I know they want us to come and do a bit of a dog and pony show of why why we feel and the importance of this project for for not only the members of the city council but citizens who may have questions of this um, the referendum that will be coming forward to, as to why enrollment growth and those type of things of why we, we feel that this is the right time to move forward with, with this project. But it's definitely, we, I, it is the right time and I'm happy that we are at this point that we're gonna be moving forward. Anyone else, Ms. Ward, Ms. Curtin? Okay. Well, thank you for that then, Dr. Jones. Um, the next item on our agenda concerns uh, approval of school board appointments to the George Mason MEH Process Planning Steering Committee. There has been a committee in place for the last several months that has been setting out a, a roadmap, if you will, a, set of uh, procedures and uh, gates to go through as as we move ahead to build a new high school and eventually develop uh, part of the current George Mason High School site that was brought within the city boundaries. Um, the brief for that uh, committee is coming to an end and there is now going to be a follow-on committee and uh, we are addressing now the composition of the school board members uh, who will be on that committee. It also co consists of two city council members, uh, a member of the planning commission and a member of the EDA. Its purpose is managerial and coordinative to uh, be a sort of traffic cop for the process. So, uh, do I have a motion? Mr. Chairman, uh, I wonder in light of the close connection between this item and the following one, if we might have a uh, consideration of the two items together and then a vote on the, uh, the, the approval um, as, it's, as, is, as is indicated in the, in the initial item. Thank you. Okay, do I have a second there? Does anybody have a guess, Mr. Webb? Are we going to have the discussion of both items and then vote upon them? I guess I'm trying to get clarification. The, the second item is strictly discussion, right. and the the initial item is one that we would vote on and vote an approval of appointments. But I think they're they're very closely uh, related, and and I I'd suggest uh, taking them together. Do we have a second on that? Second. Okay, so all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, we will now, we will then consider the uh, discussion of the George Mason MEH planning in advance of that. We have uh, two documents before us. We have a resolution establishing a steering committee and a draft process roadmap uh, dated June 5th. There has been a process within this uh, committee to set forward the process roadmap. There have been comments from the school board. I'm not sure what comments there have been on the city council side. Um, I believe the draft we have before us is the most recent. And in addition, there is a resolution establishing a uh, steering committee. And so with that, I will open it up for discussion. Okay. 
In addition, uh, uh, do you want to circulate a copy of that, Ms. Uh, Dr. Jones has uh, copies of a document that uh, seeks to, it's, it's, a potent, it's a draft agreement. Uh, perhaps, Dr. Jones, you can describe this. Sure. And this will, this will go on board docs as well. Yes, right? yes, yes. And that's why I'll explain why we're just passing it out now. Um, part of the work on this, on the planning um, from the school board members who have been um, sitting in, listening to all of the meetings, one request has been we really need to find out what that 70, 30 percent could or would could look like um, on that main campus because we want to make sure that you know our decision making is based around what's best for children and best for our school um, to make sure that for instance we have space for you know the fields that we need and that the, the school is the right size and um, so what we're looking at is um, a proposal Arcadis happens to be a very large company who we have a contract with right now. They have one of the largest firms uh, under their umbrella, which is RTKL. They've done a lot of work um, all around Tyson's Corner, know the area well. And what we're um, looking to do and move forward is the modeling aspect where they will actually come in, look at the acreage and say, and give them the task to say, can you fit everything that we need? High level model, this is not real detailed stuff as far as what a building looks like, but can you fit a building on that 70% and really challenge the architects to see what they can do. What this proposal, what you're looking at um, on the second page, you'll see some handwritten notes. That's because um, I just got this yesterday, requested some more changes after meeting with Susan and John yesterday. Justin and I met this morning on it. Um, Justin, uh, Susan and John both thought adding a fourth model instead of just doing three would be recommended. And uh, Justin also added he would love to see when they model some sort of cost analysis. Um, and what that means is if they give us a really compacted footprint for a school, and let's say they put a practice soccer field on top of parking, you know, and do multi-level parking, something very unique, really compacts the footprint, so it fits in the 70%, but isn't going to be cost prohibitive because it's so expensive to go with that design versus a more traditional design. And so they look at all of those just different components of how they can utilize the land. Um, and this is the work they do, and it's what they specialize in. The other thing you'll notice is on um, the third page in, where there's actually, I've marked out three and put four. And again, the gentleman that actually was, would update this document was in Dubai today. And so he couldn't, he couldn't have access. Um, and then the other thing is on, um, when it says a new high school, they had put 320,000 square feet just to model what that would look like. They, it said four story. We don't want to have any constraints on stories or anything like that. It's what can you do with the program of what we need to fit on that property. So this is um, basically a first step for us in our planning to really advise us so that we're getting great information from experts in the field about really what is doable with 70%. Okay, thank you, Dr. Jones. But before we open it up for discussion, I, I would just like to make a couple of clarifications for the community. Um, and, and that is, Dr. Jones mentioned 7030. Um, under the terms of the sale of the water system to Fairfax County, um, the George Mason High School in Maryland Henderson property is owned by the school system and the city in part. And has been brought within now the boundaries of the cities of Fal city of Falls Church. Under the terms of the agreement with Fairfax County, up to 30% of that can be developed for non-educational purposes. Uh, the remainder must, re must be used for educational purposes for the next 50 years. Um, and so just with that clarifying background, I'll uh, open it up for discussion. Mr. Lawrence. I would just say that this came out of the, the, the process planning committee that we've had so far that's gone slower than Susan and I had, had hoped for, but given the normal pace things happen in Falls Church, this is probably light speed compared to you know, what, what might have happened. So uh, this, this really responds to concerns that people had. Um, I know that Tony and Susan and I had and others on the school board had that you know, we weren't looking at this as a school project, which is what it really is. I think when people voted to 
you know, agree to the referendum. They saw the land coming in and they saw having the ability to develop, to develop some of the land as a way to get money to build a school. So the first thing we have to do is see how would a school fit there. We may not be able to afford the ideal school, but we at least need to make sure that we know what the school needs are and nothing else is, is you know, driving the car rather than the schools. So that's, that's really the, the genesis of it. And it may be that, you know, we, we look at it and we, we can't afford the ideal, so we take it down and maybe sell a little more land, but the idea here is to really make it so that we as the school board and the city, as the city, know what the schools really will need and, and what are some ideas about where to put it, how to fit it, but they are just ideas, not set in stone. And, and I think that was one of the concerns of the, the city council members was people are going to look at this and say, oh, this is what you're going to put there. And, and we're going to have to do some, some explaining once people do see what comes out to say, these are ideas. We've still got, you know, years to go before we get there. But I think this is a, a very, very good place to start because we need to know what we need to have. Thank you, Mr. Lawrence. Other thoughts and comments? Mr. Sharp? I'll say thank you again for pushing to get this accomplished in the most expeditious way, and, uh, but also to, to do it with a, a very, very sound decision-making process. Uh, let me mention that uh, on, I haven't read this thoroughly because it's just receiving it, but on, on the uh, page where it says project understanding, uh, in the second paragraph, there is also a mention of three alternatives, okay. which now should be four alternatives. Yeah. Uh, if I read the minutes correctly uh, uh, for the process planning committee, uh, there was a point at which, uh, Tony, I believe you presented a program description. Mm -hmm. uh, and I wonder if uh, that program description is sort of subsumed within this uh, uh, effort that RTKL would be undertaking for us? Is that? The, um, the square footage, because they're blocking. And so all of, all of the um, program for the 1500 student high school is included with the 320,000 square feet. And we also, um, I ask, um, as, as I was working with, um, with Bob, um, Bob Jones with Arcadis to please include the pool because in the community visioning we heard that really loudly and clearly and it uh, it's one of those things that as you you know get into a process you can always take things out but I thought uh, if we were going to model we needed to go with what the community had shared with us last summer at the visioning that was very strong. So the 320,000 square feet does not include any square footage devoted to the the pool area. Uh, no, it actually, right? the way it's written in here is it's 323,000 square feet um, high school with additional space provisions for a pool. Okay. So, in, and the reason we wrote it that way is that, you know, you may very well have the pool not part of the actual school building. It could be on top of the parking or something creative that they come up with, so. We might use the Bedford Falls model. Oh, yes. <laughs> Is that yeah. the idea? <laughs> um, Other questions or comments? Um, I, I would say one of the um, one of the issues that's been difficult is having an anchor, a, a way to begin organizing, crystallizing thoughts around how to proceed. Um, has been difficult. There's a bit of a chicken and egg issue with respect to a school and development. I think this is a positive step forward that um, I think as Dr. Jones has said is a notional set of alternatives, nothing definitive but simply some, some way for us to begin to conceptualize what some of the issues are. I would also note that uh, task three has a commercial use test fit component. So this isn't occurring in a vacuum. It's not a school's only exercise. It's, it's a, and nor is it a, a prescription for what's going to be done commercially, but I think it's, it's taking a holistic view of the issue. Um, I, I do think, uh, in addition, one of the issues that uh, we'll begin grappling with is uh, what are the trade-offs if we build a denser, more compact school to make more space available? what will the incremental cost be for that? Because a, a sprawling school with one level is probably less expensive than uh, something else. 
Um, and so we need to begin to understand uh, what some of those trade-offs will be. So that, that dispenses then with the, with the draft agreement. Um, okay. Comments or questions about uh, either the resolution or the draft process roadmap? And uh -huh. Dr. Jones, says this, we are discussing these right now still. The, 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 these are not definitive documents, is that correct? Well, Arcadis the is. The Arcadis is, yes. Right. And, and the uh, resolution, the steering committee resolution, the uh, city hasn't actually voted on their okay. side yet. We could go ahead if we're comfortable with the resolution. Uh, the roadmap is still in draft um, simply because city council had not given their comments. We, we incorporated school board comments, but not city council. Okay. Any, any questions or comments about the roadmap? Well, uh, yeah, Mr. Sharp. <laughs> where are, where are we staying with this for a minute? Oh, well, no, let's do one thing at a time. So the Arcadis document, any other thoughts about that? Yeah, I, I, am, I am pleased that there's consideration of a uh, multiple story structure, uh, higher density than certainly uh, what we have with the existing school. I was chatting with um, Dick Eckfeldt, Sally Eckfeldt's husband, about uh, his experience uh, his high school in Nebraska, where you might not expect uh, a uh, multiple story school to be uh, needed for uh, conserving land space, but he attended a four story high school uh, in, in Nebraska as, as a um, youngster 40 some years ago. <laughs> so it, is, it isn't uh, unusual to find that kind of thing happening uh, in, in places where, you know, you, you might not might not think they yeah. they would be placed. Uh, here we have some examples, of course, of the District of Columbia, and uh, that's uh, that's where you would anticipate it. And I'm glad uh, that uh, there's been uh, some arrangements for us to go and visit uh, at places where where they already have uh, recently constructed these kinds of facilities. We, we should be able to get some reasonable ideas of, of what current construction looks like and, and uh, how it fits on particular parcels and all that. Uh, I, I, I do hope that um, that city council members will also have a chance to, uh, to take part in, in this kind of um, exercise and, and that other members of the community might as well. That as, as we go along with the Arcadis process, which I, which I support, uh, I hope that you know, many, many others will have a chance to, to see the process unfold and, and certainly to, to comment on the results. Um, I, I, I wonder, is, is this a, a contract that is already uh, underway or what's the what's the status of that? Um, what when I actually first spoke to Susan about it and then obviously with um, Justin and John we do want to move forward and it was just to make sure the tenor of the board supports this work um, and that we just need to make these minor tweaks so that we can get the work started one of our goals was not to lose time in the summer um, because we do take a break and this this process um, I did meet with the city manager with uh, Mr. Shields yesterday so he reviewed the proposal um, when we have a kickoff meeting we'll invite everybody there um, you know for that initial meeting um, again when they're presenting we'll make sure the process planning committee all the school board will be in that loop as well so we do want to move forward so that we don't lose time time just goes so quickly and um, with even with our it's taken a while just to plan for the plan yeah. you're here so dr. Jones when is your uh, hoped for signature date for this and, and the completion date? Um, because it seems supportive tonight, um, I tend to work this way. I'll be working on it tomorrow. Um, and we will try to get it signed as quickly as we can. And then we have that five to, really five to eight weeks out. It, you know, depending on the timing, we are going into summer. I want to make sure we can get the kickoff date, you know, on the right. And it may be that our kickoff meeting, I actually group that with one of our work sessions because we already have that date blocked off. And it would give the school board probably the best opportunity for everybody to be there. Um, working around vacations and things that happen in the summer. Okay, thank we, you. So we that, already have funding identified for for this contract. We do, and um, 
really this, the funding that's in the CIP, and that's kind of been a, a, a discussion as well, um, because last year the school board asked for 500,000 in the FY14 CIP, and that got removed. We did ask for 500,000 again this year for planning, that was reduced to 250. As we've gone through this planning process committee, um, at first, there was discussion that this pot of money could only be, not only be spent, that's probably too harsh, but was going to be a decision of steering committee or planning committee. And we did remind the city that the school board asked for the funding. It's actually school funding in the CIP. And the city manager and I sat down and um, agreed that we need, we need stuff done on the city side and we need it done on the school side. And that we can take that 250 so that Mr. Shields has 125 to start uh, pulling all the information we need on parts of the land and uh, there's somebody that he has to contract with and gives us 125 right now as a budget and at our next uh, process planning committee they've asked for both of us to bring the how we're budgeting that out for this year um, so that's where we are on the, on the financing so it, it is there okay so um, any other questions on the Arcadis document it sounds as if there are do you have any other uh, comments or observations? Uh, get them into Tony by tomorrow. Um, all right, the two other documents before us, there's the resolution as well as the process roadmap. Any questions or comments regarding either of those documents? Uh, Mr. Uh, Sharp. Mr. Chairman, as I understand, uh, the resolution document is one that uh, is, is historical at this point. Not, not something that's uh, changeable. It's what one, one we're all, we've already adopted, right? The, uh, the draft uh, plan is, is one that's, uh, th that is still in a formative stage. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, now, there were some requested uh, comments. Uh, can you uh, point out where some of the, uh, the comments might be reflected? that were made. Uh, this is a June 5th uh, update, and the previous one that we saw before comments was, uh, um, well, an earlier date. Can you, uh, can you help us understand what, what changes have been made since the earlier? Right, there, and, and Mr. Lawrence, feel free to chime in. There are quite a few tweaks. Some of them were wordsmithing, kind of language tweaks. Um, let me see if I can, I don't think this, this version was redlined, but when it came back from the city. Um, here, yeah, this one is redlined. Oh, okay, good. Yeah. Well, while, while you're looking, uh, I think some of the major, major changes that we asked for were actually small words. We, we asked that a lot of the verb may was changed to will or shall. So in terms of, um, for example, reporting back to the respective bodies, what we say is the, uh, the representatives will report back to their bodies. And we made it much more active voice and determinative rather than sort of squishy and uh, you know just wishing people would do things other questions mr. mr. sharp mr. Webb Ms. Ward Ms. Kurt well <laughs> Uh, I'll just point out that uh, there is a red uh, insertion here uh, discussing uh, a visit by uh, Mary Filardo, Executive Director, 21st Century School Fund, uh, bringing some experience uh, to the attention of the committee concerning uh, private-public partnership type of development. And right. The, the, the correction there was um they, uh, when, when Wyatt had drafted this, he just forgot that she had been a speaker. So that was just adding in a speaker who had already spoken, but just hadn't been listed in the original draft. Okay. Well, um, as I was reading through the minutes, uh, her comments were particularly persuasive, I thought, uh, of um, why it's important for a program from the school side to be set out at an early time and, and developed and, and attempted to be placed on the property and, and be available for discussion and, and comment. Um, and so I, I, I support all of that. 
Uh, the, the concern that I have is that um, the steering committee's process is, is in, intended to be a, a coordinating one. And there is not a, um, at least at this time, a committee formed to, uh, to look at what the, what the program substance would be. Uh, and, and I would look, I would like to recommend that there that one be developed uh, to do that with participation from a variety of different components of the staff and of uh, SAO and advisory group uh, members from our constituency uh, and that they have you know uh, I, I would suggest that they they come in at a point where where there is a draft of something for them to comment on rather than having them come in and try to try to create the chicken or the egg uh, uh, by you know by, by themselves I think this this uh, expert will be uh, very uh, useful in facilitating a process that that could uh, allow for a group to to usefully comment on the the, the kinds of uh, drawings that the the expert is coming up with and come on that Dr. Jones. I, yeah, I, you know, when you sit on these committees, I know everybody hears different things, so I can only give you what my perspective is from uh, the person that's probably going to be charged with the work, I think, to organize this. And when I sit on the committee, I see the, the steering committee very much as it really, they're not supposed to be a decision-making body, and, and we, they've talked a lot about that, that everything comes back to the school board or the city council, and we're trying to work collaboratively and jointly together. And uh, Mr. Shields and I have had very... Um, you know, very straightforward conversations that the school must have a school's representative, I know the city's going to have a school representative, that you can't even have one person who's really looking out for school interest, 110 percent like Bob does with Arcadis, and then have somebody who's looking out for economic development because they're going to side with one or the other. So we're really working on that so that when the steering committee starts, then the steering committee would charge you know me as the school superintendent to be able to and i'm going to say the asac committee because everybody can visualize that but getting a big uh you know collection of people together that would then start working on that detailed program and i would envision that we would want people from the business industry you know talking about stem and what a building of the future what we want that to look like inviting experts in for you know uh, that really are in building design looking at lots of different buildings across the country and across the world so that piece the steering committee would we would decide as a steering committee to say, okay, this is the next thing. You've got to figure out what, what the school needs to look like, and the school would be leading on that piece. While the city side, you know, I, I have no interest, not that I don't have any interest, I don't have the expertise, to go and deal with WMATA and do all the things that Wyatt and his team are going to need to do, and that we're constantly working and coming back and sharing with the school board, sharing with city council, but we're, we're getting these working groups. But to me, that comes just after we just, this planning, this, this plan, the steering committee starts. When I look at the roadmap, that's how I interpret it. And, and John or, or Justin may have a different point of view, but... I can clarify that I wasn't suggesting that the steering committee should be the, the one to focus on what Arcadis right. drafts. I was suggesting that a, a different committee, right. one that is oriented at the schools, yeah. should be put together to, to be able to comment on the, on the draft that Arcadis puts together. And that that, that I think reasonably could, could, could um, converge in terms of timing so that Arcadis has a chance to do the drafting over the summer and this school committee could be ready to make comments uh, in the fall when the, when the draft has been has been developed. I think there are two different pieces, and I think when I present the budget, Mr. Sharp, the, the first piece is the blocking, and that's really what this proposal is. It's, the, it's where you take the 320,000 square feet, and they're really trying to block that. They're trying to block the pool, the square footage that you need for you know, a football field, and fit all of those pieces on the land. Then once we get that and we know, gosh, we can do this four different ways, or wow, it doesn't work at all, unless we're willing to give up this and this and this, then the next step that, that once that steering committee has started, I think it's a, we're going to be very well informed as a steering committee to know what the next step needs to be. And the next step from the school side is going to have to be drilling that down. So we know we need a high school that fits X amount of kids, and then that whole committee work starts with a totally different group of people. 
So I think we're saying the same thing. I just see the steering committee starting and then it's like we're able to take off with that process and really get in and, and look at what the school would look like. That help? Uh, yeah, it does. I, I think it's perhaps a, uh, uh, a line or two to be inserted in the roadmap uh, to indicate that there will be this uh, point at which a, a school-based committee is making comment on the drafting that's been put together by, by the Arcadis uh, folks. I'm going to make one more, just for clarification, because Arcadis is doing this work right now, and, and I love Arcadis. I mean, I think they support us a lot, but we may get too. ready to drill down <laughs> and be able to, you know, really look at details of a school. We may need a different firm. Arcadis may still be involved as the owner's representative, but it may be a totally different consultant firm that has expertise in nothing but building design that actually helps that committee. So it may be a joint effort. So I'm just trying to clarify this proposal. That's why the rest of the 125 is going to be needed because you're going to have another. And Mary actually talked about that, you know, that it costs money to be able to do the, the planning that we're going to need. But it may very well be a next layer that's a totally different consultant firm. Um, that has a different level of expertise in, in really building high schools and 21st century schools. My suggestion related not to uh, Arcadis or to a different consulting firm, but to a school-based committee. Mm -hmm. And I would like to suggest uh, inserting a couple of sentences to uh, indicate that a school-based committee uh, would review draft uh, of drawings that uh, are intended to show how schools and economic development activities could fit on the site that we, uh, that we have available to us. So Mr. Sharp, with respect to the school-based committee, I mean, I, I, I agree that there are two things going on here. And I agree that they're, they're largely separate, if only because you can't develop anything unless, until you get the school off the, off the land. Um, so I, I think, as I conceptualize this, see if I can understand what you're saying, is, is first of all, I agree that the heavy lifting should be done by a school-based committee um, with respect to what the school will look like and how the schools, if possible, will make um, space available for economic development. Um, I, I think as, as one sequences it, the, the big issue is going to be what will a school look like, how would it fit in this transit area and with economic development, you've got students, and so the, the, the flow in terms of, of critical paths and work will be get the vacate land so something else can be done with it. And so that all turns on getting the school done first. And I think um, that's something that this board in conjunction with other bodies should be able to do. But we, we should begin to work intensively internally. And I think this Arcadis notion is, you know, it's it's an oversimplification to call it a sketch on a napkin, but it's the beginning of the beginning. Um, where and how it will unfold, I, I don't think any of us know now, other than you know, we, we do need to begin to see you know, what's possible and what's completely out of the question. Um, and this will help um, give us some reality-based um, start, at, at which time I think then um, as, a, as, a, as a body, we, we should be in a position to take it to the next level. Um, you know, there were some issues in the planning committee that were raised about uh, approval of budgets for various studying. I'm, I'm all in favor of coordination, but I think we need to maintain our prerogatives to do as a school what we see uh, as what we think best need, meets the needs of the schools and ultimately the needs of the schools um, should align with the needs and interests of the city financially because you know we, we need to have a, a viable working 
um, city with you know, flows of money that allow us to, to, to invest and go forward without uh, overextending ourselves. So is that, am I kind of where you're at, that, that really what we need to do is to lay the groundwork internally for taking it to the next level at once this thing gets going? Uh, I think you're also headed down the same path that, that I am suggesting. Uh, your last uh, portion there about uh, financial capability, I think, gets us to a step beyond this. Um, you know, where, where Arcadis is working is really with concepts, uh, land uh, configurations, and, and school, mainly school configurations, fitting on this on. 70%, whichever, whichever segment of the land you consider uh, the 70% to be in. And, and that's, a, that, that's a conceptual process, I think, unrelated to financing. Uh, but then I think you do need to go on to the next step, and I'd suggest that's, another, that's a separate committee altogether that, that, that goes on to that next step. Uh, but the first, the first step is more conceptual, prog program-oriented, and there is a there is a process, process that takes place there with its own, with its own committee process. And I, and I might just add, I was just trying to think about the document because, um, and again, it is, it's a lengthy document and it's gone through so many tweaks here, here. trying to get everybody on the same page because it's, it's just everybody sees things a little differently. But I think what the piece that you're really talking about is the school master plan is from the vision of the committee that we have in here, which is to be. So that's like that next where you're talking about the big concept first and then the school master plan, what, what we've, what they've, the way that it's listed in the plan after everyone's tweaked it is that the school uh, will work with construction experts, the community to determine the school master plan where we're really drilling down. So I think that that's, I mean, is that you, when you've been at the committee where you're seeing it? Which, which page you want, please? Um, a 2B is on page 8. Um, where, like right now, we're at the very beginning of just trying to help inform this whole committee to kick us off on the big kind of overview. 2B is when we really have that committee that we're going to put together and um, look at all of the space program needs and the parking and all of those pieces. But I think that was the intent of that section. And again, um, you know, John or, or Justin, if I'm misinterpreting, feel free <laughs> if you see it in a different way. Well, um, if I see the way this is laid out in outline form, uh, issue one is in 2015, and 2B is even further out than that. And I'm suggesting that uh, we need this review by, the, oh. by a committee uh, once these drawings are done by Arcadis this summer. Oh. So okay. that would be in the fall of 2014, yeah. not sometime in late 2015. Okay. Um, oh, never oh, mind. Oh. I, uh, you all cleared it up for me in that conversation. I'm, I'm good. Okay. Mr. Lawrence. I, I guess the main question is, are you saying before the Arcadis results are presented, another committee should weigh in? Or once they're presented, then the committee should start weighing in? Because I, I'll, I'll be real honest. The when I said we moved fast, what I really meant was we were moving way too fast for pretty much the rest of the committee. And we got a lot of pushback about, you know, why are you doing this, and this is too fast, this is going too, too far. And I, I think if we go back to them and say, well, we've, we've got, we actually want to put another committee together to look at this before, that's, okay, that's, that's not what you're talking no, about. No, I hope I was clear earlier. earlier in the discussion here that Arcadis should do this work during the summer okay. oh. and, and, and get these drawings okay. done, okay? And then a committee uh, that is broadly based, okay. represents the different constituencies, um, can look at these drafts and comment on the drafts right. Right. and say whether right. this makes sense, <laughs> whether it, you know, things need to be modified here or there. Uh, so no, I'm not saying that the, the committee, the committee should start and come up with some kind of plan. That's not it. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's our, I, I like the Arcadis start, okay. uh, get us a technical drawing set, set of uh, drafts together, let a committee, let a committee comment on those, but, but get that comment done, um, 
in an earlier time frame than okay. I think what is called for by the draft here. Right, yeah, I mean, right now, Tony, they said they could do this in six weeks? Yeah, it, I, I say five to eight. They, they're telling me five to six, but I always, depending on our time schedule. So I would say at the max would be eight. We would try to do it in five to six as far as the conceptual aspect. It's right. just making so sure. That, that, yeah. that works for me. Yeah. Yeah, because the idea is before we, you know, take a break in August, this would be, you know, we would have this in hand on the agenda to actually look at in August so that when we go into the fall, yeah, you set up another group and then you keep moving forward. So I think we've, we've all been saying the same thing, just not <laughs> so well to each other. Well, uh, again, this, I, I appreciate the great difficulty in pulling this document together, getting counsel and economic development authority and planning commission and school board to all uh, you know I, I, I know how hard this is with just you know two or three people trying to come up with something when you have um, multiple constituents yeah. multiple interests multiple contributors um, well I, I, I'm just saying that this is this is one one area that I think um, the draft roadmap as we have it I think could be uh, usefully modified and and uh, help us to uh, get a step-by-step -step, uh, move, move this process to a, uh, a further useful place on on the uh, on you know getting to successful completion and 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 do it in a in a way that that makes sense quickly that's it okay. Ms. Ward I want to make sure that Everything that you wanted covered was covered. Or if My questions have been answered. Thank you. <laughs> uh, um, Mr. Lawrence or Dr. Jones, just so that we manage expectations, could you explain what the Arcadis deliverable is? It will not be detailed blueprints, correct? That is correct. It would be very high level blocking where they uh, take the property and they will do four different uh, if as long as it's not cost prohibitive right now we've written in three we do want to get the price on the fourth make sure we feel good about that um, they will do the modeling and have different scenarios for us on that campus and uh, one thing that the city manager and then also in meeting uh, with with the planning members and then um, you as well Justin was to make sure that we charge the architects to do their very best design work where they need to make it fit on 70 percent because then we're really because it's really easy just to go and say design a high school on the property we have um, we could all do that probably um, the difficulty is using 70 percent and being able to get the program that you actually need and so we're gonna we're really giving them a tough task and they may come back you know once they sit at the table and say wow this can't be done well that'll be very telling <laughs> so we're hoping that they they don't you know but um, I already when I charged them with that task just in talking about the document they went well um okay we'll have to look make sure that can be done so i mean that was their first reaction so they know it's a challenge to bring their best skill set for us does that help yes i i, I think so um anybody have any other questions or comments i I'm, I, I do think you know one of the concerns i still have about the roadmap document is that it does it does have more of a parallel development feel where I do think this is much more a series where the school has to be completed before development can begin and as as Mr. Sharp alluded to I think that has serious financial consequences because it means the needs financially for the schools will hit before the cash from the development shows up with certain exceptions I mean, you could, there are ways to do it, um, but, but in others, I think we need to think about that sequencing. And, and I think, you know, the, the best thing we can do as the school board is to address what the needs are. Um, I, I think, Dr. Jones, one other thing I would ask, uh, because I think it's important for the community to be aware, um, for, for a while now, we have used the marker figure of 275,000 right. square feet um, we, we, in this document with Arcadis, we're talking about 320, and I think that ties in with enrollment projections, expandability, you know, Washington and Lee has trailers only a few years after they finished. Um, could you speak a bit to the enrollment piece of the equation in this as well? Just 
high right. level. Right, because of the growth that we're seeing, especially in early childhood in those cohorts, continue to move through and all of the um, growth projections from Weldon Cooper, which are based, based on a birth rate. Um, we have upped the building from where you know you, we would have been if we were looking at this two and three years ago. And um, part of that has to do with our growth rate is different you know, than Arlington and Alexandria than Fairfax. We are you know, predicted to be again over 6%, which is a lot. Um, and our strongest growth is still coming in early childhood year before last we were just over 9% this year we were 19% which means large group of children moving through the system continue to grow because you add children to those co cohorts almost every year it's very rare that a cohort actually moves through and doesn't grow especially where we are in a growth phase right now so this high school is planning for the future and future enrollment growth thank you dr. Jones um, any other questions or comments well, uh, just a as you made the change from 275 to 320, was there a difference in the, the year at which you were uh, focusing uh, in terms of the projections so that you were saying, okay, well, this will last us through 2028 instead of 2025? I I'm not sure. And I know we see so much data on the board, but there's a big long chart, I actually have it in my wall, that shows low, middle, and high projections that we shared during the budget. And if you go back and look at that one, it's we're trying to go out 15 and 20 years with all of our projections. Right now, the unknown is I've factored in the economic development piece. That's going to be the unknown for us because we have Rushmark, Harris Teeter, and Northgate all coming online within the next 24 to 36 months. So as we work with uh, the city staff and economic development authority, it's really also figuring out are there going to be more developments coming online. Uh, I was in a meeting just the other day working with city staff on West and Broad, uh, which they're calling the Spectrum now. So, you know, it's, it's, it's actually not the Spectrum condo that exists, but it, I guess it's Spectrum Development firm. Um, but they're the ones that are looking at West and Broad. So, you know, when people say, and I try to communicate this to city staff, when they ask me to project 15 and 20 years out, we can look at single family homes, we can look at the birth rate, take all of those components and, you know, create that chart. But if we add another thousand units to the city, or we add another 40 split lots, which adds another 40 single family homes, that can, can change that chart. So we're doing the very best that we can to be forward thinking. Um, and the city is to really seriously looking at the economic development side right now and, and what they approve and kind of what impacts um, as far as proffers, you know, to help pay for capital and all those components. All right, thank you, Dr. Jones. And, and I would just note at the, uh, at the end of our package today, we have the regular enrollment update that doesn't show things getting smaller. It's sort of steady, steady as she goes. Um, if yes. we've maybe settled on a modification to the roadmap, I'd like to go back to the um, appointment of the group, um, you know, the steering committee going forward. I think that was our thing to approve this evening and uh, okay do, just want to make sure have we have we addressed everything else on the uh, the underlying documents um, just a quick question was the resolution vote passed yesterday from the uh, from the steering committee is that document uh, now voted on or is it still I don't, I don't out think, there um, I don't think that the City Council has voted on that yet um, for us, and we can certainly, you know, do it as a voting item. I, I don't think the city council has, but I'd have no, to. No, I, I think we should. This is listed for discussion, and we should defer it. But I think just for the, for the record, okay. um, just want to be clear that I don't think it has been passed. Yeah. Um, okay, and with that, we'll now go back to the uh, appointments to the process planning steering committee, uh, which which we had skipped over it, it now will be the it's not the it's technically not the process planning uh, steering committee anymore it would just be the steering committee but but uh, be that as it may <laughs> that's a good point <laughs> yeah, thanks thanks very much for that clarification uh, the the um, 
composition of the steering committee in the resolution uh, matches up with with our um, with our draft proposal tonight for appointments uh, at least as far as the uh, uh, the set members are concerned uh, the um, the question of whether there would be an alternate is that is that covered here in the resolution the alternate is addressed in the resolution yes uh, I believe it's um, okay no I actually let's see that's in the I believe that's in the rules of procedure but it is not actually right. in the okay. resolution yeah well that those There's rules a useful of procedure clarification would also, to make would, that the rules of procedure I guess would also need to be referenced perhaps in the resolution or or, or in the roadmap as it's uh, as it's finalized. No, there's the, yes, there, there's an appendix in the um, roadmap that does, I believe, have that, that in it. But it did not make it to the resolution. Good catch, Mr. Sharp. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I just like to say, as far as the structure of this whole thing is concerned, I think it is it is helpful to have a steering committee. Uh, that that is um, roughly of this composition and and have it be a process planning committee uh, and not not a substantive decision making body uh, and, and and I know there's there there's maybe some some concern that it that it will morph into a substantive uh, decision making body but, but I think, I think the, the solution to that is to make sure that there are some, some parallel things happening at the same time, uh, like the Arcadis and the committee process that we just discussed a while ago, and, and, uh, and, and that, those, that those processes are, are appropriately um, tailored to the, to the question uh, that's that's substantively at hand. Uh, in, in other words, it, is, it isn't just a bare bones, you know, uh, broadly uh, representative group like the steering committee. It's more, it's more concentrated, and it's more representative related to the substance of the question. Okay, and if if we if we keep those parallel processes in mind as the steering committee is is working, I think I think there won't be this. Uh, vacuum for the steering committee to feel like it has to fill because because something's not happening in the program development area or something's not happening in the budget development area okay uh, so so uh, I, I, I think this this works uh, for me in terms of coordination uh, and it um, I'm, I'm, I'm Ready to move on to uh, to approving the uh, the group to to go with the the steering committee uh, again with with that understanding that that this steering committee is continuing as a process planning group and that there will be parallel substantive decision making groups uh, that that uh, come into existence at appropriate times uh, at the at the coordination of the steering committee. Okay, do I, uh, do I have a motion? Nope. I recommend that the school board approve the appointment of school board members, Susan Kearney, and, um, uh, John Lawrence, to the GM MEH Process and Planning Steer Steering Committee, and school board member Justin Castillo as an alternate. Second. Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Moving on, sections, okay, our next item is authorization of signatures for assistant superintendents.
Dr. Sorry. <laughs> this is just so they can sign off officially uh, on documents, um, and especially when I'm absent, which is all the time, not really. Um, but it just gives them the authority. If I get a motion. Mr. Chair, I move that the board approve the authorization of signatures for Assistant Superintendent Lisa High and Assistant Superintendent Hunter Kimball in the absence of the division superintendent through June 30, 2016. Second. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Abstentions? Okay. Uh, STEM update, Dr. Jones. Um, this was actually a request of Mr. Ann Kumas that we actually have this as an agenda item. So I just wanted to update the school board tonight. Um, I will be bringing, we'll be doing our work plan review and update this summer where we start looking at next year. And it will be a request of mine that we actually have a, a STEM advisory committee like we did for technology this year. We're at that point where um, STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math is really moving rapidly. And we want to make sure that we're connected in all of our buildings pre-K through 12. As you know, we have a STEM lab at TJ. In our new building design at Mount Daniel, they'll also have a STEM lab. Um, we're having a lot of uh, requests at high school right now for computer science, and we're really trying to reevaluate what we're doing for computer science because the demand is growing. It used to be a course that students took as an elective when they were juniors and seniors. Um, now it's a course, children are children, students, young people are coming out of middle school and they're already starting their coding and so they're looking for it in high school. Um, so we'll be having... And, and we've also, next year we're adding STEM at Mary Ellen Henderson. As, right. As, as, Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Kimball. Yes, in our budget. Um, but we really want to make sure the curriculum really flows um, for that. So we'd like an advisory committee that really looks at those four components very closely and intertwined. Okay, any questions on that? Uh, just, just a comment, and this is something that Dr. Jones and I have discussed before, but that if that advisory committee is created, that that would be an appropriate one to place a student on, um, seeing as it directly relates to all the curriculum that they would be uh, dealing with. And I might just comment on that too, Maeve. I, um, I kind of see this as being a whole group of students, um, which e even on our technology advisory committee, we've had two different meetings where students came and it was so valuable for us. We had, um, uh, I don't know if it was our last meeting, I think it was our last meeting where we had probably six or seven students there. And so we see that really valuable. And on that committee as well, we want to make sure we have a team of students and especially for STEM. So we'll make sure that happens. From a variety of schools and grades as well. Thank you. And I think that's a good point, Ms. Curtin. I think one of the things that we should think about going forward is with respect to the advisory committees and student input, how we can get input from all levels of students, um, because I think that's important. Uh, so, Mr. Witzel, I will, I will I look forward to hearing your ideas about that. Um, all right, next, construction update, Dr. Jones. Okay, and I just have to make a comment. One of the, cha one of the challenges is of getting TJ, just, and I know that you, you, you'll think of this, but our advisories are often in the evenings, and our little people go to bed early. So it's not that we don't want to invite them, but their moms and dads have to feel like they can, you know, they're the type of student that can stay up a little bit later. But. And we ran into that problem even with some students from MEH um, yeah. earlier this year with the preschool naming committee. So, you know, we'll have to look into that a little bit more. But mm, lucky you, Zach. <laughs> um, okay, right, so construction, construction update. update. Okay, uh, for construction with pre-K right now, um, in all honesty with pre-K, we're, we're trying to really move forward. We've had some, some hiccups just with the permitting side, um, and it really has to do more tying this project with the city stormwater. Um, that has been probably a, a greater challenge than we've thought. I was working with uh, Mr. Shields today, asking for his assistance, because we need to get this really moving at a much faster pace. So I'm working on that. Um, with TJ, we actually had the final uh, billing sign-off today for task one. Um, I had requested that they get it by tonight for task one and task two. The only reason task two has not been signed off is that we know there's about, uh, there's cost savings. And what happens with cost savings, that 60,000 is they have to go, of course, in very detail, make sure we know where every penny goes. And we get 75% of that, Hess gets 25. So it'll be at least probably 45,000 that we will get back. Um, so we wanna make sure we have that number correct so we don't give up even one little penny, so. Um, 
And then we've talked a lot about GMMEH, so I think that we're okay without Mount Daniel. We've also talked about with the ordinance tonight. Question, please, about uh, uh, stormwater, if you will, at GM. Uh, we've had some difficulties with the roof leaking uh, during storms at GM. And uh, I wonder if there is uh, some thought to assessing where those happen to be coming from and whether repairs uh, can be made prior to the opening of school for next year. Um, in all honesty, GM is really, really, really old. And we, had, we did um, lots of repairs this year. We've had them out all year long. Every time you get one of those huge big rains, uh, another hole opens up. So um, it's really trying to get through. It kind of ties to all this other work that we're doing. You know, do we go and, and spend a million dollars on roof when we trying to get a handle on what the timing's going to look like? So we've been trying to do the fixes, but we've, we have the roofers out there, I mean, on a weekly basis, and it's just you can't necessarily see them. And some of the rains we've had have been really heavy, and they just, and a lot of them are not coming through the actual roof. People think they're roof leaks, but it's actually like it could be a place in the mortar where it's coming through, you know, where the roof and the wall are meeting. It uh, can be a leaky window. Um, but so we, it's been a challenge for us, admittedly. And, uh, you know, we had awards um, two weeks ago, I think it was, and we had to get the trash can out and put it on the stage. It was not pleasant, but it does get, I guess, the message across that we need a new high school, um, which is the only positive, having a trash can in the middle of awards. Um, but they are, they're, on, they're up on the roof every single week, and we had a detailed look at the roof uh, last summer to try to make sure we could get every area we knew uh, where the leaks were, but it's been a challenge. Is, is it uh, a question of needing funding to, uh, to do more to uh, alleviate the problem? Now we actually re-roofed, I mean, a lot of the GM building this summer. It's just new leaks keep springing up, so it's not, has not been a funding issue. Now, if we want to do the whole building and just go and say we're going to go re-roof the whole building, that's, you know, and that may be something if we are still having these issues in the fall that we may want to look at for the CIP, but it's, it is a big chunk of money that you're going to be spending while we're waiting on the high school, but it's also a problem having it leak the way that it does. Um, but it's just, it's, I mean, and Mr. Kimball, you're, feel free to weigh in, but they did a huge thorough look of the roof and fixed every area that we knew um, was leaking and we just keep getting new ones. It really needs a new roof. And we've, we've tried to delay that until we knew the timing well, of the project. And, and, and which is why one, one of the um, items um, in next year's, in year's budget, we do have um, uh, you know, ongoing maintenance um, f funding budgeted. That was one of the items that, that, um, that we recommended that the board reduce. Um, so it went from, I believe, 225000 down to about 175000 yeah. something like that. But we, there are funds there. And that has been the traditional source of when we, we have these issues. We had these issues uh, a couple of years ago, I think four or five years ago, at Thomas Jefferson, um, and uh, those have since obviously been addressed. Um, but um, yeah, that, that's where we turn to in terms of funding source to address these things when they do come up. I just want to ask about that roof. Um, have, has any um, study been done to make sure it's not affecting the integrity of the roof, like it's not going to collapse on anyone? They did a thorough assessment last summer of the roof. We brought people in to do that for us because it's it's too big of a project for our own staff. Right. Um, and that's why they repaired huge sections of the roof where we knew we were having issues. So there's no safety concerns with the roof. Really, most of the leaks, I mean, because it comes from the up here, <laughs> people always think it's the roof, but it's really a lot of the other challenges, door frames, windows, HVAC units that it creeps in the side and in an old building, all the seals that are around things. And it's just, it's a challenge because everything is old in that building. Yes, yeah. I know. Okay, <laughs> thank you. That's actually a cold comfort to realize there's it's not always the roof, it's something else as well. <laughs> Any other uh, questions? All right, uh, moving on to uh, resolutions, the VSBA media honor roll. Uh, we have resolutions before us today and there are documents going around. I hope everybody has uh, signed the various resolutions. 
Um, we have two this evening, recognizing uh, Nicholas Benton, publisher and editor-in-chief of the Falls Church News Press, and Stephen Siegel of the Falls Church Times um, for their ongoing uh, reporting uh, relating to community issues, including uh, and especially uh, the Falls Church City Public Schools. Uh, do I have a motion here on, uh, on those resolutions? I move the school board approve and adopt the 2014 VSB a media honor roll resolutions for pres as presented, recognizing Nicholas Benton, publisher and editor in chief of the Falls Church News Press, and Stephen Siegel of the Falls Church Times for their ongoing and exemplary nature of reporting on the Falls Church City Public Schools to the community. Thank you. Uh, why don't we do a voice vote on this, please? Good. Mr. Castillo. Aye. Mr. Lawrence. Aye. Mr. Sharp. Aye. Ms. Ward. Aye. And Mr. Webb. Aye. Thank you. And I would just say that uh, even in a small community such as uh, Falls Church, where news gets around quickly and readily, um, these, these uh, media outlets, the Falls Church News Press and the Falls Church Times are, are indispensable assets and I think they really add to our, uh, our, to our sense of community. We now move to the, sir. Uh -huh. Oh, excuse me, Maeve. I'm sorry, I had a little target fixation on the agenda here. <laughs> it's okay. Um, I would just like to say that, um, especially with the news press in school, when you see students um, reading it around the halls and get very excited to see things written about their classmates or about themselves, um, I think it's really great. And I've seen the same thing with the Times Online. So I just, we really, really do appreciate the recognition that we give our school system and um, the way we're able to highlight all the students and not just the sports teams and not just, you know, um, the drama department, but really every aspect of our school system because all of our students are so wonderful and do excel in their own ways. So it's really great that we have these wonderful people who are willing to recognize that for us. And Ms. Curtin, I'd say you were remiss in not uh, tooting the horn of the, the lasso, which I think often has some really fascinating and uh, sometimes I would say uh, maybe not groundbreaking, but they cover things that nobody else covers and they do a very good job of it. So uh, maybe, maybe we'll see them up here next year as well. Uh, so with that, we can uh, move on now to discussion and possible action to adjust school start times. Dr. Jones. Well, this is um, kind of a task I think that, you know, I hear probably more than anything else from SAOs and parents. It's the 7.30 a.m. start time for middle school. It's early. Um, I'm, you know, you can't find anything instructionally uh, that supports middle school, you know, growing adolescents having to wake up at the crack of dawn and start school at 7.30. Um, and so at the request of SAOs, we started exploring, working with uh, transportation department. Uh, we also worked with uh, Gibson Consulting when they were here uh, on the efficiency study. They actually timed all the bus routes so we knew, had more information even just about how long does it take to run a high school route, how long does it take to run all of our middle school routes. Um, we also um, did a, an early survey just to get an idea of, you know, how many people really support um, support changing the start time. And one of the components that, um, that we wanted to know was, you know, does it have to be four different routes in order to make this work, or is there a way to consolidate and run MEH and GM at exactly the same time? There's a lot of instructional benefit to that. But as we really got into the process, we had a, a couple of challenges. And um, the first graph that you look at is uh, where it just talks about, would you like to see MEH start around 8 instead of 7.30? Just getting a general idea from the community and very, very supportive. But when you got into the actual other parts of the survey, they don't, there was pushback in that parents were nervous about middle schoolers and high schools riding the bus together. 
to run a one route, and it's almost impossible just to have two buses following each other around. Um, so you, you know, that was something we needed to get feedback from. We also uh, wanted to know from middle school, high school parents, especially middle school, if we expanded the walking zone like we do for high school, would the parents support expanded walking zone? And they really didn't, especially uh, several comments were even about the sixth graders. The parents just don't like their kids walking, you know, that young, which we weren't really surprised by that. We were probably a little bit surprised that they're, the kids riding together uh, made them nervous because it used to be that way here. And so many of us, I think, have either, you know, been educators in systems or we grew up in systems where that was just the norm. But our community, we, you know, listened to that. So we then went out and surveyed again, which is the, the second one, because after we did our study and really looking at route times, and as a reminder, we did pull the bus out of FY14. We've also pulled the bus out of FY15. So the last thing we want to do is put in a plan where all of a sudden you have 12% enrollment growth in September and we're short buses. Now we're still hopeful that we'll be able to get those buses through the CIP, but we can't count on that. So the next uh, piece that we surveyed was uh, in order to eliminate a 7.30 start time, it, and I will say this pre-K pre time was actually, um, it's not the school start time, and we clarified that with our pre-K parents. It should have been eight, but they do get dropped off early. So some parents were like, is that when they get dropped off or is that when they start school? Um, looking at uh, pre-K with an eight o'clock start, GM with an eight o'clock start, because we can run those two together. We've done that this year, um, which is what GM does now. MEH would be at 810, which is, you know, 40 minutes difference for a middle schooler is a, is a big deal. Um, the one thing about to get that work is Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, it extends their school day a little bit, which I really like. Now, I will say the students weren't so keen on that piece. They liked sleeping in a little bit more in the morning. They would still like to get out at 2.30, though, um, which <laughs> that doesn't, doesn't work well. Can't have it both ways. Parents were very supportive. Um, then at TJ would be 8.45, 3.45. So it pushes them back just a little bit. And the graph you're looking at um, is giving you the reflection of how that kind of plays out. The green was the support for the change. The blue is now we prefer not to change. And then the orange was we really don't care. Either way, it works for our family. So it's been supportive um, to, for the start time change. The other aspects, and I'm sure Maeve may, could probably chime in on this if I remember correctly from the beginning of the year. Um, one, of the, one of the things that happened this year in moving eighth grade back is in order to make the after school athletics and activities work, uh, it really has had a big impact, I feel like, and, and they can correct me as students if, if Zach and Maeve think I'm wrong, but in our club structure, because we had to change when athletics started, um, because we hang on to our middle schoolers right now, the eighth graders that are in JV for that half hour. And quite frankly, if you ask, I mean, I, I, the principal and I, the study hour doesn't work that great. It's right after school. It's 30 minutes. It's kind of like a holding pen for 30 minutes for our eighth graders. But it's impacting our high school because they are getting out, and I believe it's 15 minutes after you guys get out, they have to be at practice. And so they can't, they're having to make those difficult choices. Well, this club meets after school. They used to be able to go or to go see a teacher for half an hour to get help with their high school calculus or whatever. They've lost that. And so the start time change kind of impacts all these different areas. And it allows everybody to have a reasonable time that you're getting to school, reasonable time that you're getting out, and doesn't have huge impacts on anybody, but helps our middle schoolers, you know, tremendously. So I am support of changing, um, and I think our, you know, the survey is supportive to say that, and you're still, you will probably hear some people that don't like it. Um, the, we have some teachers that like getting out at 2.30 because it's better for their commute. And then we have other teachers who like getting out a little bit later because they have daycare issues and other things. So, um, you know, the teachers are pretty split at MEH. Um, I think high school teachers were more supportive because of the club structures and the things they know where it's impacted high school. Um, so that would be, I mean, that's, that's kind of the overview of what's happened this year, the survey data, you know, seven and 800 responses is a lot uh, when, you, when you're surveying the community trying to get responses back. So I feel like we've, they've had a strong voice. SAOs were very strong uh, when our, at, through our SAO meetings this year and really wanted, you know, one of the reasons I took this uh, under, under, undertaking was because we were, I was asked to. Um, to see if there's any way to, to help our middle school kids not have to be at school at 7.30. And this really is it. I mean, with the buses that we have, with the time constraints that we have, this, this is it. Um, and listening to the community, because we cannot run three routes with the buses we have.
Um, Dr. Jones, just one thing to clarify a little bit about the um, club and the sports practice start times. Um, originally, that was sort of the perception that it was because of middle school and we didn't want to keep them at school too long, and so that's why we moved the start time back. But after more conversations with Coach Horn, um, it seems that the larger reasoning has to do with accountability at the high school and that Coach Horn is not comfortable having students unsupervised for the 45 minute period that it was before and so now because of liability reasons that's why practices have been pushed up and it just so happened to coincide with the eighth, eighth grade move and that's sort of what um allowed that change to happen so quickly well I, I can tell you we've been in discussions just i mean actually today about that he's very supportive of the time change and sees the positives maybe that's living through it for the year maybe that's where he was at the beginning of the year but he also understands that it's um been difficult for high school students and i think you guys have had a strong voice to say it's yeah. messed up your club structure it, so maybe he's changed his mind but he's very supportive of the change that was of sort today. of my goal yeah we, we've, we've talked worked, about it a lot yeah <laughs> And he is, uh, in his uh, new title, he's over student activities as well, so maybe that helps as well, not just athletics. So, Other questions? Mm -hmm. We've got a little green light over there. I want to say I support it. I like the idea. I think 7.30 is an extremely early start time, and I, as a parent, I lived through it. <laughs> it wasn't fun. Thank you. Uh, just one question, Dr. Jones, with respect to the eighth graders at uh, MEH who would be playing JV sports, mm -hmm. possibly, mm -hmm. how, how does that work? Um, well, for practice, they would get out at 3.20, and Mr. Horn would move, I believe it was 3.45, move back to the 3.45 start um, for all the practices. So they still have a little bit of time to go see a teacher or change or do what they need to do, but not such a big gap that they're, they're running around as eighth graders. Okay, great. All right, well, thank you for that uh, creative. And uh, just one other question with, with respect to um, the, the number of responses seems pretty robust, um, but, but in, uh, in terms of percentages of uh, total number of uh, families and students, is this uh, how many people out of the whole population have responded? Um, well, you know, we approximately. Have, yeah. Um, that's a really hard. That's a really hard question. Um, probably the MEH one was easier because it was just MEH. So that was, and that was mainly, right. you know, parents and teachers. The one on the the one on the bottom uh, was very mixed with parents, teachers, and students. So, um, you know, I, I could I can get you those numbers. So I can disaggregate the data and tell you what it looks like. Actually, if you even go down on the bottom, you can see like the parents that, and some of them it just wasn't an interest to. You know, there are people that, especially if you have a little kid that's in second grade, I mean, or first grade, they haven't experienced the 7:30. So definitely, they're much more passionate when you get into middle and high school. Um, where, although TJ, when I'm looking here, there were 199 yeses, 81 no, and 10 didn't matter. So they actually had a pretty good response to have 200 responses from that. You know, and that's 700 yeah, students, yeah. so. All right, well, thank you. You're welcome. All right, the next item on the agenda concerns the uh, selection of the VSBA delegate and, delegate and alternate. Now, can I ask, are we considering changing the start time, or is this because that was on there for possible action? Because if we don't change it tonight, then we really are going to go another year. And, I, you know, and I'm okay either way, um, but... This is the only change that, that we can make work with the buses we have. So if we want to change off the 730, it's kind of, I'll, I would be bringing you the same solution next April. So I support this. It would seem that we have broad-based consensus. Okay. Does anybody have any other uh, thoughts about this? I, mean, I guess my only thought is, do, are we really sure we've heard from everybody? Will there, we, we do from time to time get feedback from community members about calendars and schedules Absolutely. and that we socialize yep. this sufficiently. Um, I think that, you know, when you survey, there, if you have 30% of people that don't like it, you're, we're probably going to hear from the 30%. I mean, <laughs> you know, and, and so I think okay. the voice of the many, definitely on SAO group, there's, there's no questions with our, with our parent groups that they want to see this change. But a lot of them have lived through it. You know, they've had middle schoolers that they were trying to get out of bed, um, and it's hard. It's a really 
difficult age anyway, and it's 7.30 is early. And it's not even just 7.30, it's, you know, you have to have them at the bus way before that. And it's dark, and yeah. So I just, I think the positives far outweigh the negatives, but will we have some pushback from some people who are gonna be cranky? Certainly. I think any time you make a decision, you know, and you've got 30% of people that would just like to keep it 7.30, we'll probably hear from the 30%, I'm sure. I just wanna make sure we don't hear from right. 60. Right. Um, <laughs> So could we uh, authorize you to go ahead and announce this? Sure. And, and I mean, see what if, they're, <laughs> if they're surrounding okay. the central office sure. with pitchforks and, uh, <laughs> yeah. and torches, you can reconsider that. Um, all right. We'll say so moved as to authorize it, but I will, I, I will cut off the pitchforks. Okay. <laughs> uh, do I have a motion then? This move the I move the authorization of the superintendent to to move forward with the change of the school start time for the 2014-15 school year. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Oh, excuse me. Oh, I'm sorry. We have to second. Second. Now with that second in place, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? So, everybody gets to sleep in a little bit, <laughs> which may enable procrastination on some people's parts that much more based on my experience. Um, so now we move to the next item on the agenda regarding selection of VSBA delegates and alternates. Um, you see here that we have uh, not populated the selections. We have uh, we have people in place now. Um, I don't know if you uh, have any thoughts, Dr. Jones. Or should we? Uh, if it's not broken, don't fix it. But uh, you know, let's. We, we the only thing that um, that I would just uh, you know offer as a reminder is just making sure that Mr. Sharp and and Ms. Ward are sure that they would be able to go in November. That they feel pretty good that you can get time off work to go to to represent. Um, so just making sure you know that that's part of it is being there at the VSBA convention. Yeah, yeah. and I think I have adequate uh, time to <laughs> plan for that. Thank you. <laughs> well, uh, I think it's uh, currently um, Margaret Ward as the uh, delegate and uh, is John as the alternate? Yeah, sorry. yeah, yeah. And I, I'm happy to give to uh, <laughs> offer some advice from my earlier experience, but uh, I'm sort of uh, conflicted out of. So you, you are okay. Of, I want of, that's that was my any, question of, was of any whether intense participation. Right. Okay. So, do I have a motion? Yes, I'm the motion guy. Tonight. You are a man in motion today. <laughs> I move that the school board approve the selection of Margaret Ward as. VSBA delegate and John Lawrence as VSBA alternate to represent Foster City Public Schools at the VSBA delegate assembly and regional meeting of 2014 VSBA annual conference. All right, thank you, Mr. Webb. We have a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, the motion carries. And now. We have the issue of uh, future agenda items. Anything you want to talk about? Mr. Sharp. Okay. Uh, one that I've asked about earlier is uh, alignment of the Fall Search Education Foundation with uh, school board uh, plans, and I'd like to specify in there a, uh, a request to, to, to discuss <laughs> whether uh, the Education Foundation should be seen as a potential fundraising source for any portion of facilities development. And we actually do have a date for that. We've been working with Ms. Hiscott because she had her vacation we were working around. And I believe, uh, Marty, I'm not sure if you have that with you. Did we? Uh, July 15th. July 15th, okay. Cool. At the work session. 
Uh, the other one we had a work session on, and we haven't had as yet a chance to follow up. Perhaps that's already been scheduled, <laughs> and that has to do with the uh, board organization. And I, it, I think, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, Justin, in our planning, that that's part of the work plan as well, is looking at that? Yes. Yeah. And, and there I'd just like to clarify that I think as we heard in our work session discussion, uh, the, the, the issues relate not just to um, whether we should have, you know, like two members of the board form a committee, uh, but, but uh, also our, our committee structure, uh, our advisory committee structure, and how that relates to board decision making. And, and that uh, you know, a, a uh, consideration of how, how we currently operate in that fashion and how we could improve it is, is, is part of that discussion. All right, thank you, Mr. Sharp. Any, anything else? Wow, Mr. I'm on the Woods. microphone. Okay, um, uh, with the previous year, I uh, experienced, uh, I was- you just said a little, there you Sorry. go. Sorry. Uh, I was planning to uh, have an extended uh, exchange student, uh, with, not through the exchange program, and we, I realized there was a uh, Falls Church City Public Schools ban on exchange students, except for, uh, at least at George Mason, I'm not sure if it was uh, schools system-wide or solely at George Mason, but, uh, um, I was wondering if there was a possibility to either uh, add a, a limited amount of uh, spaces for exchange students or to simply open it up to exchange students in general. Yeah, and, and I will say it's not really necessarily a ban. And when we get a new high school, we'd love to open it back up again. But it's had, it has been driven by seats mm -hmm. and numbers of kids. And we don't get any revenue uh, whenever we have an exchange student. And so, you know, even with our tuition students, we allow very few. Um, and then they're actually, you know, paying a minimal to be there. But it really has to do with seats and, and numbers of kids. And, you know, we're lucky that we have an international community, at least, you know, as part of our student body. But we would love to open that back up again and then when we have a chance to expand uh, we certainly will will look at that okay yeah because we see great value in it we just don't have any seats <laughs> so if we get rid of one student we can take one on it sounds yeah. like it's a one-for-one one exchange okay well thank you for that mr. Witzel um, anything else anyone All right, Dr. Jones, your report. Take it away. All righty, you have heard a lot from me tonight, so I'll try to be brief. Um, this is just a fun time of year. We have awards and field days, and um, usually they hope it rains so they can roll in the mud at you know MEH, but uh, I don't know if it's supposed to rain again. Um, graduation is on the 16th, so I encourage you to come. It's going to be another fabulous event. It's it's always just, it's such a beautiful venue, but it's just, that's really what we're all about is making sure, you know, all of our students walk across the stage at the end of that 12th grade year. So I encourage you to come and join us there. Um, I will be down in Radford this weekend uh, for the playoffs. And so we'll keep you posted or you can follow Twitter and see what's happening down there. Um, looking forward to that. There are, um, just a, a lot of great things happening in our schools and trying to stay focused and, and keep everybody enjoying school but where it's not just wasteful for the last couple of days you know of school keeping people focused is not always easy this time of the year um and other than that it's just uh, full steam ahead to, to close out the end of the year so it's going great all right thank you dr jones moving on now to board and student liaison comments uh I will begin with you, Ms. Curtin. Well, I just want to say uh, what a pleasure it's been to serve in this position. I want to thank all of you guys for making it such an easy thing for me to do, for always being so supportive um, of myself and the position in general. And I know that you will continue um, 
to extend that help and support to Zach as he continues on um, and you know in future years because that's really what this is about um, making sure that the students continue to have a voice in our system because we do you know I think it's been really beneficial and I think we have so many students who really want to and can contribute and help us um, in that way I want to thank Mr. Lawrence as Mr. Casillo mentioned earlier at the beginning of the meeting for really pushing for this position um, and helping me out last I guess November now and since I've been on since February it's been a wonderful time and you know I'd probably be lying if I said I enjoyed every minute of it um, <laughs> in fact I would be <laughs> but <laughs> Um, it really has been such a wonderful experience and I've learned so much uh, from each and every one of you just about um, commitment and dedication to community, um, about procedural things that will be so helpful to me later in life and hopefully you know, I can continue on in some sort of uh, capacity to serve Falls Church or some other com um, community. Uh, but it's just been, it's been so great and I'm, you know, trying not to get emotional and really tell too many stories or anything like that. And I know I don't want to be the one talking for the longest, but thank you guys so much for everything. Um, and I'll be back, I'll visit. So <laughs> thank you. I'm just really grateful to have had this opportunity. Well, thank you again uh, for everything you've done, Maeve. You've been a, a, you're a tough act to follow, but I'm sure that uh, Mr. Witzel will, will uh, do a great job. Uh, Ms. Ward. Um, I'm reporting as the um, Athletic Boosters Liaison. Um, I really wanted to mention a new scholarship that the Athletic Boosters started. It's in memory of Judy Lubnow. Um, it, it is funded by her family, uh, partially. Um, I don't know if any of you remember Judy, but she was a driving force um, in the community, and this uh, at Mace, in all the schools, actually, um, and especially with the athletic boosters, um, she was tireless volunteer. She was um, you could always count on her for anything. She would um, organize the sports banquets, and you, you just name it. She was there. She was at all her son's baseball games. Um, uh, just a wonderful lady who who uh, certainly left this world way too soon, um, leaving some young children behind. And um, this uh, scholarship, which was presented for the first time last night at the sports banquet, um, was given to a student um, a student athlete who, not necessarily for their athletic abilities, but more for their spirit and how they supported their teammates and boosted people's. Um, uh, you know their spirit and you know got them moving in the right direction um, real supportive person and I'm happy to report that um, I have a, I'm sorry the name I have a hard time with it but uh, not to name I think to show not to name to show yeah thank you and she's um, great she deserves she's it more than anyone lovely, I played lacrosse with her and lovely young awesome. lady and I um, she is the goalie for the girls lacrosse team and I understand she just started playing and she's just doing a fabulous job yeah that's correct and yeah. we really couldn't have done this season without her and she's just so cheerful and goes to all the games and everything so really did embody the spirit of Mrs. Lubno thank you and and um, and she also is a basketball manager yes yeah and um, anyway so I'm just happy to report that uh, that new addition to the athletic boosters um, scholarships um, and I'm happy to report that um, Judy is being remembered um, for her wonderful spirit and her just tireless energy thank you Ms. Ward Mr. Webb uh, don't have any reports this evening. The uh, Wall Street Education Association is actually meeting, uh, met this evening as well, so I had the conflict of here and there. So I will uh, speak with Debbie and get some any pertinent information that needs to come back to the board for the next meeting. All right, Mr. Lawrence. Uh, just a, a couple quick things. Uh, the Gifted and Talented Committee had their, their last meeting of the year. And they had um, Liz Germer came and talked about how you take, you know, special ed and gifted and talented and realize that they're not mutually exclusive and how you, you know, recognize special talents in, in ways that aren't, you know, able to be recognized by tests. So I think it was a, a very good turnout. Um, and we had our, our, the new applicant who we just approved today to, to join, went there, spoke out. She is going to be a, a, a great addition. So I, I think that's, that's 
that was just a, a wonderful, wonderful thing to see. Um, the TSA, the Technology Student Association recycling event at, at MEH a couple weeks ago was an absolute scream. If you want to have fun with kids, give them screwdrivers and teach them how to tear motherboards out of computers and take chips apart. Um, we must have done about 40 of them. I mean, there was this, this one mother there who swore she didn't know anything about it, and at the end, she was just ferocious at tearing things apart and separating them out, so they, I, I think they made quite a bit of money. Um, <laughs> secondly, Tony, I think it's next week we go meet with the Mount Daniel yes. Association. So we're, we're continuing the, the Fairfax Neighborhood Association has a meeting, and they ask <laughs> us to, to come and, and talk to them about the, the latest. And we've been keeping them up to date, uh, keeping John Faust, the supervisor, up to date, uh, Janie Strauss, the school board member from Drainsville. So we're trying to, you know, keep everybody informed so we, uh, you know, eliminate any possible problems. And then, you know, just a few words on Maeve. Um, you know, I don't know why, but I feel proud. She's, you know, not, not my kid. I've known her for years, entrusted my son to her, you know, when she's a a babysitter, so she's, she's kind of like family. And what I love about her is, A, she's everywhere. She, she doesn't sleep at all, it seems. <laughs> um, but she always takes the initiative. I mean, she, you know, she's the one who, who came to us and said, why don't you have a student representative? She founded the, the Best Buddies chapter. She's at every fundraiser. And, um, yeah, I'm just gonna miss her. She's, you know, only going to UVA, I know, and she'll be back often. And uh, she's just down the block, but this is, you're just great. So thank you for everything. Thank you, Mr. Lawrence. Mr. Sharp. Well, this weekend you're probably aware is the uh, Tinner Hill Festival, uh, mainly uh, in Cherry Hill Park for the sort of free events, but uh, there are also ticketed events at various places, various times. And uh, it started with uh, just a handful of people uh, uh, meeting at, at, at one time out in, out in the front of the Mary Ellen Henderson uh, parking lot. Uh, and uh, it has grown into a really regional uh, blues festival. So I encourage you to take part, enjoy it this weekend. I was very pleased to uh, enjoy the Memorial Day uh, with our walk, but uh, I must say I, I enjoyed the, the, the ceremony uh, at 11 o'clock, especially this, this, this year. Uh, Harry Shovlin, a former middle school teacher with us, uh, is the uh, organizer and, and uh, MC for the event, and he does a terrific job each time. He recruited for this uh, occasion a former city manager for Falls Church, Tony Griffin, uh, who after a few years as city manager here in Falls Church then went on to be assistant county executive in Fairfax County and then became, was for 12 years the county executive in Fairfax County. He's now retired. Um, he also uh, had uh, Dave Tarter, the mayor, and, and the Falls Church Concert Band as part of the, the program. And I just want to mention a couple of things about, about the, what um, transpired there. To, I, Tony Griffin gave a, quite a, uh, a, a good speech about um, his experience as, in the Marine Corps, and that his uh, assessment was that that was the most important job that he ever had. Uh, despite his successes in uh, city local government administration, uh, his his assessment was that that was that was the, the the most important work he had ever done. That was as a Marine Corps uh, lieutenant in uh, in Vietnam. Uh, Dave Tarter uh, sort of uh, talked about something along that same line, saying that uh, you know it isn't it isn't the, uh, the poet who's provided us with freedom of speech. It's the soldier. Uh, it isn't uh, uh, the, uh, the, the politician who, who protects our 
uh, rights to uh, a, a trial by jury. Uh, it's the it's the soldier. So that there there was quite a, a uh, and that Dave was drawing upon a, a literary um, compilation of those different uh, roles that that the soldier brings to our to our community and and to our nation. Uh, the the band of that day, the concert band, uh, did a wonderful rendition of a uh, uh, instrumental performance. I, I'd never heard it before. It's called Normandy, and it's intended as a uh, all the different sound effects created by the orchestra of the the morning and the assault uh, on June sixth. Uh, 1944, of uh, the the the, uh, the assault on the Normandy beach, and it's just it just takes your breath away. It was really really well done, uh, and I hope uh, many will have a chance to hear that uh, uh, done on on subsequent Memorial Day. So it was just just outstanding. The uh, uh, another very moving event that I was able to attend was the student awards, and uh, I would ask if, if uh, someone uh, has, a, has a compilation of the um, different scholarships and awards that uh, were provided on that evening, if put that on uh, our uh, materials for board review or otherwise get it distributed to us, I'd, I'd enjoy seeing that all again. But there were, there were so many highlights of, and particularly uh, remembrances of of great leaders in our community, uh, starting with with Don Frady, <laughs> uh, who was both a, you know, a great great civic leader and and uh, a great great public administrator for our he was he was public works director for many many years, and then uh, uh, contributors from from the school administration, all the way from uh, uh, Mary Pace, who was a school administrator uh, in Fairfax County, and uh, the wife of our own superintendent, Dr. Pace, and, and then the Spragues, uh, uh, Nancy Sprague certainly being an administrator here and in Fairfax County. And then uh, uh, Jesse Thackeray and, and her uh, family, of course, uh, Franklin and, and Jesse both have scholarships that uh, are in their, uh, in their names, and uh, it, was, it was great to hear those uh, awards being given. Uh, also, thank you very much for accommodating Lou Olam at the IB Awards. It was very, very kind of you to make sure that he was able to be a part of that. Uh, I've been working with the Partnership for Youth, as you know, for uh, quite a long time, 15 years actually. <laughs> uh, that uh, organization is going through a difficult transition. Their budget was, was not funded by the Fairfax County Board of Supervisors that for this upcoming fiscal year. Uh, they're looking at various options, including uh, merging or partnering with another organization. Uh, and there's really quite a, a bit of uh, important work, I think, still to be done uh, in the youth service area uh, that, that isn't being accommodated at the moment. Uh, mentoring, mental wellness uh, in, in the youth sector uh, is very, very underserved, I would say. Uh, and I think there, there are too many tragic um, occurrences that we see around us that, that confirm that, that, uh, that those services are, are not adequate at this time. Uh, so I, I hope um, that, that we'll see some improvement on that front. I, I will just mention that this issue of Medicaid uh, and Medicaid expansion at the state level, uh, it's, it's an interesting issue. Uh, it's one that, that uh, I think uh, people have different opinions about. But I'll just say one thing that I've learned uh, in regard to mental, mental health services for youth is that with Medicaid, one of the reasons that it's underserved is that the Medicaid reimbursement for the providers is too low. And providers are not able to stay in business and serve a great many of Medicaid patients. And so there's a, in, in addition to just, you know, this issue of Medicaid expansion, there's the issue of the adequate reimbursement of the providers 
uh, who, who do take Medicaid patients. The, 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 the straight out expansion won't, won't change, isn't going to change that right away. Uh, and uh, we, we need some reform of that system in order to, to have a, an upgrade in the availability of treatment. So uh, I look forward to working uh, further on that issue. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sharp. Um, I, I, was, I was pleased to hear about the scholarship in Judy Lubno's name. Uh, I, I think that's fitting and, and very appropriate, and I think that's a great, uh, a great way to remember her legacy. Um, I don't know when last we met, but I don't think we've met since the uh, Falls Church Education Foundation Gala. And we would be remiss uh, to not note that uh, somehow, to find the odds, they did an even better job than they did last year. Um, it, was, it was really quite, quite a great uh, affair. Um, there was a great uh, concert of the sixth and seventh grades last night at MEH, among a lot of other things. Uh, I echo Mr. Sharp's uh, observations about the awards assembly at George Mason. Uh, Really a great way to cap off what's been a great year for, a, for an outstanding class. Uh, I would also be remiss if I don't wish the girls' uh, soccer team uh, luck and success on Friday, and then I hope Saturday as well. Um, you know, with, with respect, I guess in closing, a, a good way to uh, tie some of this off, we, we have uh, you know, Judy Lubno, we have Lou Olam, Jesse Thackeray, Steve Sprague, um, all the way up to, to Maeve, and uh, one of the things that uh, I, I remember from governor's school that my daughter attended down at Randolph-Macon was the provost gave a speech that I think is appropriate as you consider Memorial Day, and that is how important it is that we make this country worth fighting for, and I think these people have done that, and uh, I think that's what's great about Falls Church. And with that, Zach, I will let you have the last word. This is initiation, right? So you have to uh, <laughs> come up with something. Uh, I'm just so glad to be here and to have this uh, incredible opportunity. And I'm um, uh, kind of scared to follow in May's footsteps, but uh, <laughs> I think we'll make do. Uh, and I'm just. It's just incredible to be in a community which opens opens its arms to a position of, to allow students to really speak their voice. And uh, I've, I've heard so many excited students tell me things that they want to hear uh, done. And it's just great to have that passion of everyone and have it just get to be some, uh, someone embodied of their students' passion. So I'm just really excited to have a, a great year ahead of us. And once again, thank you all for uh, accepting us and me and Maeve and just having this position. All right. Well, Actually, uh, I'd like the last word. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm so sorry. When everyone was welcoming you, uh, welcoming you aboard, Zach, I didn't have it. I was multitasking, and I wanted to tell tell you how happy I am that you are our new um, student board member. And Maeve, I will miss you. And like John said, you are like you're proprietary to us. You are like. Like, I do feel proudly about you as I would my own child. And, um, and Zach, you do have big shoes to fill, but I think you are going, she's going to pass that mantle over to you, and you're going to fill it fine. And we're very looking forward to having you with us for the next year or so. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Zach, you don't have to get the last, last word in now. <laughs> um, all right, we now have uh, minutes from May 1st, May 6th, and May 20th to approve uh, by unanimous consent. And we have materials for board review relating to enrollment for your uh, review. And with that, we will stand adjourned. So thank you very much. Have a good night.